Okay, good morning, church. Good morning. Good morning. Can you hear me alright at the back? Can you follow me? <laughs> I'm pretty loud. They were trying to set me up with all these different mics, and uh, yeah, I think my, uh, my my head's a bit too big for for the mics. They don't make it for the uh, Pacific Island and Maori heads. These, uh, <laughs> these mics that are made in Taiwan, eh? So uh, we're just doing the, the old school with the, the, the mic on the stand. Uh, but I'm grateful to be here. Uh, it's always a blessing to be here. I was talking to uh, Pastor Aaron probably, well, when did you ask me, Pastor? Probably about two months ago. Yeah. Pastor asked me if I'd like to come and preach and when was the last time. And I, I can't actually remember the last time that I preached here, but it was a while ago. And uh, since I've preached here, there's quite a few new faces in the church. So uh, it's always a blessing. When you visit uh, one of the churches, the sister church, uh, IBC Central, it's one of Cornerstone's sister churches, it's always good to come and see new people, new people uh, at church, amen, and to see more, to see more seats uh, filled because that's, that's what it's about. And just let's be reminded that the church is not just a place we, we go to, a church is the assembling together of the saints in a certain place, right. amen. Yeah. So the church is the people that are gathered together in a place. And so you are the church, and uh, that's going to kind of be uh, reiterated, I think, this month through your missions uh, month, your missions conference, is this whole idea about going to the ends of the earth, carrying the light of the gospel with you. And uh, I hope and pray that as we start this morning that the message uh, will be a blessing to you. Uh, if you know me, um, I'm just going to preach the word of God. Uh, so if you get uh, offended... Um, it's going to be from God's word, so that's okay. Amen. Amen. I'm not here to offend you. I love you, fellas, and uh, hopefully you love me back. But I'm not here to offend you, fellas. But if the word of God offends, uh, let's let God's word do that this morning. If the word of God challenges us, uh, let's be challenged this morning because you know the uh, difference between complacency and faithfulness often looks the same. There's a huge difference between the two. But sometimes we call something faithful when really we're just being complacent. Mm. And God hasn't called us to be complacent Christians. In fact, He said to His disciples that you will be my witnesses into all the world. Into Jerusalem first, Judea, mm. Samaria, Samaria, Judea, and the outermost parts of the world. And so um, if God makes us uncomfortable, we need to praise God for that because that's a blessing. Okay, yeah. Yeah. And right. God moves us to do the things that God's called us to. Because there's quite a few new people in the church, I thought I'd... Just start off, I know pastors, pastors, how long do we have to preach? Because I'm, I'm one of those guys. It's not the Lord's hour, it's the Lord's day. Yeah. So if we go to three, we go to three. But I understand that that's not how we operate. Uh, and you got baptisms after, so I know we've got a restricted uh, time frame. Uh, but we'll do our best to, to stick to the time frame. But because it's quite a new, uh, lot of new people, I thought I'd give a little bit of a background about myself. So you can know, uh, who's that? Moldy Fuller standing up with us. <laughs> Well, he's not from around here, he's from somewhere else. Um, so I just thought I'd give a brief testimony of, of, about myself. So I came to the Lord uh, back in 1997. Uh, so 22 years ago, uh, actually uh, in May, May 17th, 1997, uh, I went into my first ever church service and uh, the invitation was given to have someone uh, show me from the Word of God how I could be saved and I accepted the invitation back in 1997. I was 16 years of age and I was in need of a saviour. Amen? Amen? I was at a point in my life where I really needed Jesus. And uh, I praise God for Him. I know He was searching for me and He was making Himself known to me. And it was in 1997 that I came to know Jesus as my Lord and Saviour. I grew up in Ōtara. Yeah? Do yeah. <laughs> know where that is? Yeah, it's a promise thing. You've got a promise. Okay. You know how they said nothing good will come out of Nazareth? You came out of Nazareth. <laughs> I, I come from Wotara. Um, I've been there my whole life, there or thereabouts. I live in a suburb called Flatbush, which is just on the, the outskirts of Wotara. But if you look at the old boundaries back in the 1980s, I'm still in Wotara. Well, at least that's what I tell myself to kind of, kind of make me feel like I'm still, still home. Um, yeah, there, there were some traumatic events that took place in my life when I was young. Uh, the first major traumatic event that took place was a month before my, my seventh birthday. My, my dad was diagnosed with cancer. I remember him coming home uh, one, one day after work and uh, talking to me. I was only six years of, old, but six years of age, but I remember the, 
conversation very vividly. He said, son, I've got cancer and I don't have long to live. And uh, within two weeks, my dad had passed away. And uh, that, that, changed, that changed my whole family framework because my dad was the breadwinner. He was the one who looked after us. My mum was sick most of her life. She had rheumatic fever and I had a really bad heart, had artificial valves and all that, so she couldn't work. So we went from, um, you know, having everything we need to basically having nothing. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm from that era that uh, when you had no milk, you went and asked your neighbour for some milk. And sometimes you'd ask your neighbour for some milk and they didn't have any milk, so you'd have to ask the other neighbour. And uh, sometimes you end up just having water instead of milk or, you know, sugar. I'm, I'm, I'm from that era where there was times where we didn't have anything at home. Um, so it was a real, you know, for a six-year-old to go through uh, losing your father, the one that kind of looked after everything, was quite hard to, to have that experience happen to me. And then uh, when I was 14 years of age, um, my mum fell sick. Mum fell sick and uh, within a week she passed away. Uh, so by 14, I was orphaned. Um, basically, have brought up myself since I was 14 years of age. Uh, Obviously from 14 to 16, 16 is when I come to know the Lord. So July uh, 1995 is when my mum passed away. Um, and May 17, 1997 is when I got saved for it. So just for the space of uh, just, uh, just under two years, really, really battled with just living, really battled with purpose, really battled with, you know, why am I here? You know, um, always feeling bitter, bitter towards someone um, about why things had to happen in, in, in my life the way they did for me. Like, what did I do to deserve to have no parents by 14 years of age? Um, amongst uh, a lot of other things, I grew up around a lot of uh, drugs and alcohol. Uh, my house was, uh, the, the, actually, my house was, in our area, was the main tinny house in Ottawa. <laughs> so there was three tinny houses back then, uh, controlled by a gang called the Tribesmen, and my house was one of them. And so I grew up around uh, drugs, and alcohol, pretty much my whole life, grew up around violence. My brother-in-law was the uh, vice president of the Black Power, Black Power in, in Auckland. Uh, so I saw, I saw a lot of violence, saw a lot of drugs growing up. Um, but somehow God just protected me through that whole situation. And a friend of mine, the, the, just kind of going on a bit long here, but a, a friend of mine came and visited me. I was living at my auntie's house in Ottawa. And a friend of mine, I found out where I lived, came to visit me and told me he had just started going to church. And I was just like, wow, you know, you go to church it wasn't something that was normal for, for this particular friend to want to go to church. Any, any time he talked about church, my mate was a Samoan, uh, it was always negative. So to find out he was going to church was like quite a surprise to me. And then he invited me to come. And I remember uh, going to church, first thing was on a... Friday night to the youth group, went in there, um, experienced a youth night, experienced kids having fun without having to have drugs, alcohol and party. And that was the first time I ever experienced that kind of happiness before. And it was on that Sunday, um, the Sunday after that Friday that I went to church for the first time. Um, back, back, back in those days, it's not the same now because you're a Baptist church and you guys just dress the way you want. Back in those days, everyone wore a shirt and tie, except this one Māori boy that was at church that day, and that was me. I was basically just wearing pants and a t-shirt and a, and a car. I was wearing dickies, car, you know, gang, gangster clothing. <laughs> and I walked into church, and uh, for some reason, I, I guess, you know, in Baptist churches, most of the seats are reserved. <laughs> so anyway, the seats that were were the ones up the front. So I just went and sat up the front and uh, heard the gospel. And then the pastor just gave an invitation if, if there's anyone here that wants to know Jesus as Lord and Savior, come forward. And man, I I couldn't get there quick enough. I couldn't get there quick enough. And the rest of the history, history family, I've um, been with the Lord now for 22 years. Uh, surrendered to the gospel ministry. So I knew within six months of being saved that God was calling me into the gospel ministry. I didn't know what that would look like. But I knew I wanted to preach the, the word for the Lord. And I knew I wanted to tell people about Jesus. Amen. So I went to Bible college uh, for the space of six years um, and uh, graduated from Bible college, got married, uh, had, uh, we've got two children, got Jordan with me today, uh, my wife and my daughter are at our church uh, today and um, we planted Cornerstone Baptist Church in 2005, I was 24, so I was quite young, uh, there was a lot of uh, 
criticism, a lot of, you're not going to make it, a lot of, are you sure, are you a call to the ministry? There was a lot of that going on. Uh, my daughter was only one, my son was only a few months old, but that's what God had called us to do. And uh, so we're 14 years in two weeks' time. Uh, August the 14th, uh, 2019 will be our 14th anniversary uh, as a church. And uh, God has been God has been doing a, a wonderful work there. Ministry is not easy, eh, guys? Ministry is not easy. Ministry has its ups and downs. But Jesus didn't even say it was going to be easy. Mm -hmm. Amen. Mm -hmm. um, but if people are coming to know Jesus Christ and have been taught to observe all things whatsoever God has commanded us to teach them, that's what it's all about. Yeah. And uh, we are thankful uh, at Cornerstone that we have a sister church that shares the same vision as us. Mm -hmm. That we don't want to be complacent. That we want to see people come to know Jesus as their Lord and Savior. And what I'm going to talk to you about this morning may not seem to be connected to missions, but just bear with me. By the end of the message, you will see that what we are going to speak about this morning uh, is definitely connected uh, to missions. Because my hope and my prayer uh, for being here this morning is that I can, I can mobilize you for the gospel Amen. if you're not already mobile with the gospel. Yeah. Amen? Because that's what Jesus has called every Christian to do, is to go into all the world and to tell people about Him. And so my hope and my prayer is that through the Word, I would be challenged to be mobilized for the Gospel of Jesus Christ. So the theme of your Mission Emphasis Month uh, is uh, carry the light of the Gospel to the ends of the earth. And that's taken from the uh, Book of Acts. Amen? What a theme! What a theme! Carry the light of the gospel to the ends of the earth. What a great reminder to us of the responsibility and the purpose of every Christian. Amen? To take the light of the gospel to the world. If there's anything we are, we are to be the light. Amen? Amen? If there's right. anything we are, we are to be the light. Now, turn to your neighbor and say, you are the light of the world. <laughs> say it with a bit of conviction, not like... I mean, not, not, don't speak in tongues, I hurt you. <laughs> Turn to them and say, you are the light of the world. <laughs> say to them, say to them, a city that is on a hill cannot be hid. <laughs> neither, do, neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel. <laughs> but on a candlestick that it may bring light to the house. <laughs> and then you guys know the rest, so let your light so shine before all men. That they may see your good works and glorify our Father, which is in heaven. Uh, John chapter 9 verse 5, if you would turn there with me, I just want to make a connection here uh, concerning the theme and then we're, we're going to talk more about this as we go through the word today. So let's study the word together. Uh, as you turn to John chapter 9, let me pray. I know we've had a lot of prayer this morning, but let me pray because I want God's help. I want God to do a work um, in this place uh, this morning. John chapter 9 and uh, verse number 5. Father God, we need your help this morning, Lord. We desire to be Christians, Lord, who are Christ-like. We desire to be genuine followers of Jesus. Lord, I pray that if there is ones amongst us that would admit this morning that they have been complacent in their walk, I pray that you would challenge them this morning to go from this place and be the light to this world. I pray, Lord, that as your word would go forth, that it would accomplish its purpose, as Isaiah, your prophet, said. And I pray, Lord, that each person that is here would be here, ready to listen to your word. I pray, Lord, that as your word goes forth, that it will not return void. Yeah. And we know, Lord, that if we get into your word, your word will get into us. And it will change us. It will transform us. It will conform us to the image of Jesus. And so, Lord, we just pray, Lord, that you will just be upon us this morning. That your word would enlighten us, illuminate your word to us, Lord, may your Holy Spirit convict us and challenge us. For it's in Jesus' name we pray and we all say, Amen. Amen. John chapter 9, verse number 5. If you're there, look at what Jesus says concerning himself. John chapter 9, verse 5. If you're there, say Amen. 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 Okay, there's only seven of us, so we'll wait for the rest of the church. <laughs> Let me know when you're there. Say Amen. 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 There's uh, 12 of us now. <laughs> Everyone there? Yep. Amen? Amen. Okay, that's good. John chapter 9 verse 5, it says, Jesus said of himself, as long as I am in the world, what does he, what does he say? I am the light. I am the light of the world. Amen? As long 
As I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Now, come with me to Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. And then look at what Jesus says as part of the sermon on the mountain in Matthew chapter 5. We're going to have a look at verse number 14. As Jesus teaches on being the sight and the, the salt and the light of the world. He says in verse number 14, what does he say to church? Ye are the light of the world. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. And then he turns here on the Sermon on the Mount and he says to the church, or he says to those disciples that were there with him, Ye are the light of the world. So he who is the light, Jesus Christ, passes that mantle to his disciples, amen, and calls them the light of the world too. You see, as followers of Jesus, we too are the light of the world, amen, and we are to move wherever we move with the gospel of Jesus Christ. People must see Jesus in us, amen, people must see Jesus in us in order for them to come to know Jesus as their Lord and Savior. We must love people differently from how the world loves them. Jesus said to his disciples, by this shall all men know that you are my disciples if you love one another. And we must take the light of the gospel to them like Jesus did. Amen. And what we're going to see today, because as we get into the portion of scripture that I'm going to preach from this morning, it may not seem connected to missions, but trust me it is. Because what we see is that no matter where Jesus went, he was the light to the world. Right. Now, even if it was a situation that Jesus uh, wasn't, wasn't necessarily prepared for, even though he's God, he, he knows all, amen, he was the light to the world. He made himself available to be the light to the world everywhere he went. Mm, right. Now, what I want you to do this morning, and I need some help this morning, can I have two uh, volunteers? Two volunteers. Uh, don't all come running at once. <laughs> yeah. I don't have any chocolates. Just come, come forward and just help me up. Here we go. This is Brother Eddie, the one and only, the main deacon of International Baptist Church. <laughs> and this is Brother Dow, the one and only, the other main deacon of <laughs> Central. Okay, brothers, if you can just hand those out to everybody, just make sure everybody gets a, a piece of paper. Should be enough there to skill if want to do it. Yeah. Okay, just, just make sure everyone gets one, please. So sure we'll all we'll get a piece of paper. Now what you're gonna do on this piece of paper is you're gonna pledge what you're gonna give to missions this year. Alright? And it's gotta be at least four figures and no decimal points. Alright? So it's gotta be at least one thousand dollars or more. All right? Okay, you know, that's not what you're doing. I'm just... <laughs> some of you are like, hey, do you think you are? You can't come and tell our church. <laughs> what's it to you? Uh, just just get, get a piece of paper when you've got it. Um, just hold it in front of you. Hopefully you've got a pen uh, as, as well. Just make sure everybody is getting one. Well, while the other people are getting one, uh, what I want you to do is I want you to take that piece of paper, and on that piece of paper, I want you to write down what your biggest issue in your life is right now. Just between you and the Lord, I want you to be serious. What's the biggest issue in your life right now? Don't put down the Warriors losing against Canberra on Friday. Okay? That is not a big issue in your life right now. All right. I want, I want you to be serious about this. I want you to just think about what's the biggest issue in your life right now. Okay? I don't want you to share it with anybody. I just want you to write it down. Now, if you don't have any issues, there's an issue. You're not going to be able to write anything down. But we all got issues. I mean, we all got some challenges in our life. And I want you just to write down what's the biggest issue in your life right now. Everyone understand? Yeah? Cool. I know some of you need more than one piece of paper, but it's just not just one. Norm's like over there, plus you got any more? <laughs> have you got a 1B5? Have you got a more? <laughs> just one, just, just, just one issue. Oh, funny. But, but yeah, let's try to be serious, serious about, uh, about this. Um, I want you to write down one of your issues, and then I want you just to fold your piece of paper, 
You know, I want you just to, just to lay it down in your Bible, put it in your pocket, or something like that. Okay? We'll just give you a bit of time, give you a few more seconds. Not too much longer though. So write down whatever your, your issue is. Cool? We good, Father? Yep, okay. Now come with me in, in, in the book of Luke. Luke, we'll, we'll look at chapter 8. Luke chapter 8. If you're there, say amen. Amen. Yeah. I'm one of those pastors, eh, that I like you to communicate with me. I don't like you to fall asleep while you're in church. <laughs> so if I say amen, it's normally well, I want you to say amen because then that means you're paying attention. Okay, I don't know what Pastor Irwin does. So, <laughs> but if I say Luke chapter 8, if you're there, say amen, you say amen. Amen. Cool? Yeah. Yeah. Because that means I agree or so be it or it is done. Amen? Amen. 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 Oh, cool, man. What a good service. (laughs) Luke chapter 8. Carrying the light of the gospel to the ends of the earth, I want want to show you something here um, in this portion of scripture in Luke chapter 8. To eight. We're going to read from verses uh, 43 to uh, 48. Verses 43 to 48. The main idea is up there. The main idea is basically, or the, the summary of what we're going to talk about, is Jesus is the light of the world and he heals a woman of her illness that no one else before him could help her with. Okay, nice and simple. Main idea this morning. Luke chapter 8, verses 43. And we're going to read down through to 48. Okay, it says in verse number 43, And a woman having an issue of blood 12 years, which has spent all her living upon physicians, neither could be healed of any, came behind him, him meaning Jesus, and touched the border of his garment, and immediately her issue of blood stanched, or it stopped. And Jesus said, Who touched me? When all the night, Peter, and they that were with him said, Master, the multitude thronged thee and pressed thee, and sayest thou who touched me? And Jesus said, Somebody hath touched me, for I perceive that virtue or power is gone out of me. And when the woman saw that she was not hid, she came trembling, and falling down before him, she declared unto him before all the people for what cause she had touched him, and how she was healed immediately. And he said unto her daughter, be of good comfort, thy faith hath made thee whole. Go in peace. So let me set the scene for you, church, just so we know what's actually taking place in this portion of Scripture. Jesus, if we go um, all the way back to the start of, of Luke chapter 8, Jesus had been going from village to, to uh, village, from one village to another, preaching the gospel. It was at this time that Jesus uses the, the parable of the sower. The, the soil that goes off to sow seed and it falls on different kinds of soil. The wayside, yeah, you know, most of you will be familiar with this, the stony ground, thorny ground, and then the, the, the soil that is good ground. Jesus was preparing them for the different responses they would get as they shared the gospel. So as, the, the disciple, as he was preparing the disciples to share the gospel, he was getting them to see that when you go out to preach the gospel, not every, not every bit of soil that it falls on the hearts of men is going to be good. Some is going to fall on the wayside, some is going to fall on stony ground, some is going to fall on thorny ground, it's going to choke it up, and then there is some that's going to fall on good soil. And I guess that's one thing we have to remember, is that success in preaching and sharing the gospel is not getting somebody saved. Success in preaching the gospel is actually going to tell someone about Jesus. Amen. God never calls us to be the ones to save them, but He does call us to be the ones to go and share the gospel with them. Amen. And maybe if we would, have, maybe if there was a hundred percent success rate, we would share the gospel. Well, let me let you know, it's not going to be that way. Yeah. And Jesus prepares His disciples for the sharing of the gospel. Jesus and his disciples hop into a boat and they travel from one side of Galilee to the other side. Remember, and there comes a big storm. Jesus is asleep at the back of the boat. Yeah? Mm. 
And the disciples think that they were going to die. Why? Because they forgot what Jesus said. What did Jesus say? He said, let us go over onto the other side. When Jesus says something, we better believe it. Right. Amen. When Jesus makes a promise and a declaration, it's going to happen. Right. But the, the, the disciples find themselves in the middle of the storm and they wake up Jesus saying, Jesus, why are you sleeping? Do you not care that we're about to perish? Mm. And Jesus says, O ye of little faith, right. why did you doubt me? He calms the storm and the disciples tremble and, and fear mm. the greatness of the Lord Jesus Christ. Yeah. Jesus and his disciples go to a place called Gadara. Known also as Gurdjassi. It is at this time that after the disciples' faith is tested that Jesus goes and he meets this legion. This man that had been possessed by demons for many days. Jesus heals the, this man. And this man wants to go with Jesus wherever he's going. He wants to become one of the disciples. And Jesus says to the legion, no, you go to where you're from and you go and show people what I have done for you today. Yeah. Reminding us that our greatest mission field is where we are from. Yeah. Our greatest mission field is not IBC supporting missionaries across across the lands and overseas. And while that's very, very important, I mean, your pastor wouldn't be here otherwise. Mm -hmm. Missions is more than that. Missions is about you moving where you move with the gospel. Amen. Right. Amen. He then returns back to Galilee and there is a man named Jairus, a leader of the synagogue, a very important Jew whose daughter of 12 years old is on her deathbed. And he comes and meets Jesus as he comes into this part of Galilee. And he asks Jesus to come with him to go and heal his daughter. And it's during that trip from where he landed to go to Jairus' house that he encounters this woman with the issue of blood. Now at this time, I want you to consider church this morning that everywhere Jesus went, he was the light of the world. Right. He looked for opportunity to shine his light to all people. And he has called us to do the same. Right. Now, number one in our, in our text this morning, just so we all know kind of the context of where we're at. So Jesus is on his way to Jairus' house to heal his daughter who is sick at this time. But we find out later on she is dead. And it is during this, this travel from coming into Galilee to going to Jairus' house that he encounters this woman with this issue of blood. Let's have a look first at the woman's issue. They say that together, the woman's issue. Okay, so let's have a look at her predicament in verse number 43. And a woman having an issue of blood 12 years, which had spent all her living upon physicians, neither could be healed of any. So as Jesus is walking to Jairus' house, he encounters a whole host of people who are crowding and thronging him. Notice, it says here, in verse number 43, And a woman having an issue of blood 12 years, which had spent all her living upon physicians, neither could be healed of any, came behind him and touched the border of his garments, and immediately her issue of blood starts. Now look what it says in verse number 45, And Jesus said, Who touched me? When, he, when all denied Peter... And they that were with him said, Master, the multitude thronged thee and pressed thee, and you are asking who touched you. So when Jesus came into this place, there was a multitude of people. There was a crowd of people that were thronging him, that were pressing up against him. The word thronged implies that these people were pressing up against him very hard. You know, and I was thinking, what's a good example of this? You know, when you, when you go into a marketplace or you go into a place that's very, very packed. Have any of you been to the ASP showgrounds when there's like a real big sale and everybody's fighting for the same thing? Yeah? Have any, anybody been to one of those? Okay, well, that's not going to that's not gonna be a good illustration to you. It's, a, it's like when Poto goes to Mangere. Have anyone been to Mangere or Poto? When Poto goes, it says, oh, everybody's like coming up, pressing up against them. It's very, Poto's very... Porto is very famous in Mangere. He owes, he owes a lot of people money from his childhood. No. Um, you know, pressing up against there's a lot of people there. It's like being in a very crowded place and you could hardly move. As Jesus is being bombarded left, right and centre, 